future Jordan for that nice introduction to the series that we're going to start running now. I hope that your hair looks better than it does in this current video. Uh, okay, so I'm coming to you from the past and what we're going to do is we're going to talk with an expert in the area of intergroup relations, stereotyping and prejudice research, who can tell us a little bit more about the type of work that we do and we went over some of his work earlier in class. So specifically, I'm speaking with Frank Kachanoff right now. Wave, Frank. Hi, Frank. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, and he is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's also a McGill alum. Frank has published many very impressive articles, including two first author articles in our flagship journal, JPSB. And what really separates Frank is the methodology that he uses to advance his research on intergroup relations. So many social psychologists like myself are, are lazy and they are just looking for the quickest, fastest thing to do. And we kind of take some shortcuts in our studies, but Frank is interested in these creating immersive environments that can really simulate how groups might interact in the real world. And he's done some pretty interesting stuff in that line. So um, without further ado, I'm just gonna to talk to Frank a little bit. So Frank, could you tell me a little bit about your research program? What do you think are the main research questions that you study? Yeah, so broadly my research focuses on the impact of our social identities or social cultural identities on our on ourself and i show that it these impacts are profound and in turn um, when our social identities are threatened we'll um, engage in collective action to defend them um, and so forth and kind of social identity threat symbolic identity threat group identity threat these are really broad concepts um, for me, I've tried to narrow it down specifically on what I call collective autonomy threat, um, which is one facet of um, threats to identity, but it pertains to your sense of feeling free to express who you are as a people, your identity as a people, to kind of cultivate that identity internally and then act in accordance to that identity in society. Um, is there a specific uh, example that you like to use to illustrate this idea of collective autonomy threat? Yeah, so I think the go-to examples that first come to mind when we think of groups that lack freedom to express their identity are of historically disadvantaged and oppressed groups. Um, so we can think of Black and African Americans in the United States, um, Black uh, South Africans during the apartheid regime, um, indigenous peoples in Canada, um, where colonial forces, high power forces, um, tried to take away their ability to um, freely define and express uh, who they were through forceful assimilation um, and restrict their behaviors um, in what they could do. And that's originally starting my work, I focused on that side of a power hierarchy. Um, what is less intuitive and what I've been also focusing on in more recent stuff is how high power groups who you would think could never feel this type of threat because they have so much power and society can also perceive threats to their collective autonomy. And I've been doing some of this work um, in the context of uh, white Americans experiencing um, threats to being able to express white identity, whatever they think that might be, um, which, and we published some work showing how, you know, whether you're at the bottom or the top of a social hierarchy, both of these threats are psychologically impactful and will motivate you to want to maintain or increase your power as a group within the social hierarchy. Okay. So I think that for everyone I'm going to speak to about this, I have a question where I want to ask them, why do you think it's important that we devote time to studying what you're studying? So yours is pretty self-evident. I think that when you're using your research to talk about the psychological experience of a disadvantage, which we see in so many different contexts, yours is a bit more obvious. But I want to give you the opportunity to maybe say in your own words why you think it's so important that we study this topic. Yeah, I guess. I think zooming back a bit just to the genesis of this idea um, and when I started thinking about collective autonomy was I was actually in Richard Kessner's human motivation class at McGill. I was an undergrad at McGill as well. And so, you know, Richard is such an amazing 
um, lecture and he's, you know, talking about self-determination theory and really convinced me about all the impacts that autonomy has on our well-being and our functioning. And, um, but I, at that time, I was also taking Don Taylor, former um, professor, well, professor emeritus at McGill intergroup relations class. And he was really speaking about the impact that our social identities have on the self. And I found in my read of self-determination theory, no one really asked, well, can our social identities impact this core psychological need of autonomy? Um, and, um, you know, if this need is really so profound, but we're all, always thinking about it in terms of are the people are in our interpersonal spaces controlling us, um, what about groups and especially disadvantaged groups who don't always have their autonomy as a people supported, we're neglecting to understand the impact that um, this can have on their autonomy and in turn their well being. And so, you know, I saw this very impactful theory that I felt needed to address these issues and realities that, you know, if you're in an advantage group, you might take for granted if you always feel secure in your collective um, autonomy. So jumping off of that, about the importance of studying these issues scientifically or empirically, you're kind of, your calling card, you're a very talented researcher in many different dimensions, but your calling card are these more immersive studies that you run to really simulate in a small sense, but it's still a very immersive experience, what it's like to be a member of a group at a certain levels of, different, of a hierarchy. Um, and so I was wondering if you could maybe briefly review maybe one of these studies that you've run just to simulate the experience of being in a group. Sure. Um, and maybe just like a starting point of how, how I got to do those studies. So originally when I first wanted to study collective autonomy, we tried the classic vignette approach. And we actually, we never published this work, but we tried to convince Canadians that maple syrup wasn't autonomously a Canadian thing. And in fact, like maple syrup originated in the United States and it was like Vermont has a maple thing on their coin and you know but it kind of half worked but there was a lot of reactants people didn't really buy this it's very hard to move around collective mm -hmm. autonomy to groups the one way i found is effective to do it in a traditional sense is with a writing vignette where you have people just talk about their experiences and i've had success with that in in a cross-cultural sense and also amongst the lgbtq plus community in, in writing those vignettes, but it's messy. And so after, you know, multiple failed studies, me and Don were outside one day, um, Stuart Bio, which was where the psych department used to be. And we were like, we really need to find a way to actually have people experience this. And the starting point then was to think of what the construct was, which was, is my group free to create, define, and express their identity? And so using that theoretical starting point, we were like, okay, well then how do we simulate that in the lab? And so the first thing we needed was a paradigm to have people create a meaningful group identity. And so kind of what I would try to do is think about how do people naturally, have naturally in our history created meaningful identities. And one way was a coat of arms. I remember, I think I was like in grade three, we had to like create our own coat of arms. You know, like these are very simple things that we probably grew up cognizant of or experiencing. And so I was, I felt, okay, this is something that students will be able or people will be able to find engaging and get immersed into. And so um, that was the first step. We created what we called the coat of arms paradigm or I really got to market this better but like the code of arms task um, where you can you know it's a digital thing that in our initial things people would just you know be in the lab in front of one computer and they together select um, a, a shield color a shield charge and a color for their charge and also a name and so on where they could really say like pick symbols that reflect um, meaningful parts of their identity. Um, and so, and they would just do this as a group. And then um, the second part of, of the construct is expressing identity. And so in the first study we ever did, 
to express that identity, we did it by creating a video game um, where we were working off the old world of, well, not World of Warcraft, it was actually Warcraft 2 or 3, where there was a map editor and you could kind of create your own games in this map. I think people went simulated Pokemon, all kinds of stuff. And so I was like, okay, people like video games. We're going to work with this. And what we did was we found a way to have the avatars people would control in this game be directly reflective of the coat of arms thing they did before. Mm -hmm. That was the key. So like if you picked, you know, a black green spider and this represented something meaningful to you, you would be a black green spider in the game. Um, and then we were able, you know, by having multiple groups come in, we were able to um, tell them that this other high power group could or potentially change um, their coat of arms and in turn affect the in-game avatars. They would all, you know, mm -hmm. play in this game for 21 minutes. So I think what's important there is you're really, A, allowing this new identity to form that's meaningful to people. They would, you know, spend 10, 15 minutes. Sometimes we'd have to stop them when they're doing, creating just the thing. And so right there, it, it's, you'll never have an identity be as meaningful as what a real identity is in the real world, obviously. And that's a limitation of this work, but it's a somewhat, you know, meaningful, less minimal group um, that yeah. people can get engaged in. And Natural then, minimal group, kind of. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's, we always used to joke, it was like a, a, a not minimal, minimal group almost, exactly. you know. And um, so I think in recent versions, they even had their own food that a, a group can create? Yeah, so what we did in recent versions of this paradigm was making video games is really hard. <laughs> So I was like, I, you know, never going to publish anything if I'm just making video games my whole career. So we went to another thing that people naturally do, which is fun and engaging, which is role-playing, imagination. You know, people put on plays. If you go on Mount Royal, you can see live-action role-playing, LARPing. And so we were like, you know, forget the video game part. Well, start off with the coat of arms, but then have people pick out, you know, a cultural food they could eat and so like you might pick you know seeds or chocolate and then potentially this other group will change and we would actually bring in food and you'd have to eat a whole other food in the lab that wasn't your own this again is pulling from normal cultures like our cultural foods are important to us and yeah. cultures have their distinct foods so it's kind of bottling i guess re the real world in the lab and that was a way to do so we also did like um, they'd be able to pick physical gestures to like greet each other. So like you could waggle your ears or what I found it's kind of funny now with the current situation, but we had one where you would elbow tap or tap ankles. And now that we don't shake hands, people are like elbow tapping. So, um, but these were, you know, again, trying to have really people really simulate in a social way, in an intergroup way what intergroup relations is because it's kind of you know as social psychologists a lot of our studies aren't that social and as intergroup relations researchers a lot of our studies don't involve groups it, you're thinking about an intergroup situation but you're really removed from that context and i think oftentimes we do see a lot of similarities you know these things replicate and i i'll complement my work with correlational studies with real world groups and you find the same effects in both. But I think it's important to push ourselves to still have that actual behavioral component of their groups, their face-to-face -face in the lab or interacting virtually potentially and you're seeing how they behave and, and documenting that. So you, you have a kind of full spectrum yeah. in a paper of what's happening. This work is, is very inventive, and it's, I really admire it a lot for this, for exactly what you just said. As psychology moves more and more towards online data collection or just one person looking at a screen, you're really doing the hard work to simulate what it's like to be in a group while also maintaining something like random assignment so we can actually push the, the knowledge a little bit further in that regard. So I really admire it. Um, 
are there projects that using these or similar paradigms that you're working on now that you're really excited about? Yeah. Um, so one project that me and Nor Katili have been working on for a few years now, um, which which is really dear to both of our hearts, is this idea of what happens if a hierarchy would invert such that a formerly disadvantaged group would gain power in the hierarchy um, and have the power to structure society? Would they um, create a society where all groups are treated equally and or would they create a society that's still hierarchical but where their group is atop the hierarchy? And so we've been doing, um, we've now done two separate two-year lab experiments. So we've been actually working on this for four years um, <clears throat> where in the first part of the, it's a two and a half hour study where for the first hour you actually experience um, being oppressed. And so we operationalized oppression in two ways. So using collective autonomy restriction, you, you know, create your culture, your food, you have it taken away. And then also in terms of realistic threat, which is another key uh, form of oppression. So you're exploited, you're fo forced to do all the work in your kind of world um, where we're, we have people imagine they live on this planet called Grabodia. So you're like a Grabodian, you form your Grabodian Hoi identity. Um, there's the Aredo group who are the, this high power group. There's also a Suebla um, low power group, also low power like you that's oppressed like you. And so you, you go through this experience and then we see what happens in the second hour of the experiment where they are then able um, to gain power over Grabodia. And, and, and the tables turn a little bit. Yeah, and, and we see to what extent groups, so now they get to assign work. They have the power to change culture. Um, they also have the power to make decisions about you know, um, resource, re like actual bonuses that participants would receive. Um, and we can see in all these domains um, how different factors that we, you know, can in a very controlled sense manipulate. So like were they symbolically or, you know, collective autonomy, was that threatened? Were they realistically threatened? So we, one of our studies was a two by two design looking at that angle. Um, in more recent work, we've now looked at the impact of intergroup contact mm -hmm. um, and how that'll affect, you know, how you're going to treat your, if, if you make contact with the other low power group, how's that going to affect what you're then going to do um, with, towards your former allies potentially. And so a lot of really, I think, neat questions, which I think that I, I use this example too, because I, I think this is something that's very hard to study, you know, in the real, like how are you gonna actually manipulate whether or not a hierarchy was flipped, right? It's just something you can't do. Um, and so this was kind of a, a, a way um, we were able to do it experimentally in, in the lab. Well, it sounds very interesting. I'm really looking forward to seeing more of it in the years to come. Uh, last question. You know, thinking about your own work with the intergroup researchers more generally, are there issues or questions out there that you really want to see this field tackle in the next 10 years? Um, so in terms of theoretical questions or more of like met method methodologically? I'm going to leave that entirely up to you. Yeah, I guess I, I mean. What, what questions kind of keep you awake at night that you're, you really want to see someone tackle? You know, I, I think for me, intergroup issues are critical. Um, and especially intergroup issues that deal with hierarchy and inequality. And, you know, that encompasses um, the current discussions. And I shouldn't just say current because these are discussions we've been having a long time. And I think we're having more of it now about systematic racism and inequality um, but hierarchy, I think, is this key. Um, and, you know, for me to say specific questions that I want to see researchers address in that domain, I don't really want to do that because I think, you know, 
those questions need to be driven by the researchers themselves and also their exposure to communities in the real world and being immersed in the field and, and talking to people and listening to people. And that is going to drive, I think, the big questions we need to address. And I just, you know, can't really um, ever try to predict that. But I think what we need to do is be sensitive you know, to the conversations around us and have that, the big issues and the issues that are uncomfortable drive the work we do as scientists. And, you know, let communities drive the questions we ask, not just our own research agendas all the time. And, and then I guess the other thing I would say, and, you know, I'll just, this is probably academic suicide, but I think we need to slow down as a field and put less emphasis on just how much can we publish. Mm -hmm. I think, at least in my work, the work I'm most proud of, you know, took me four or five years to do. And I, I kind of did that work in different ways, both in the lab um, or getting also community samples or, or, or real world samples. And so you, if you, if you are going after the big questions that are going to be important to our society, we need to take the time to really address them slowly and thoroughly and do, you know, maybe a little less, but do it really well because these things, you know, have critical consequences for us. And, and, and that involves actually going out into the field or you know, looking at sometimes qualitative data, which can be messy and take a really long time. Um, anything that you think is the best way to get to the truth on these questions, um, I think we need to hold ourselves accountable to taking the time to get at that. Okay, those are very, very good answers. I think that the field would benefit greatly from moving in that direction. Just wanna say thank you so much for your time, Frank. I really appreciate it and I think at this point, really well and so hopefully it's just the first in a really long series of productive interesting conversations that we can have about intergroup relations over the semester so with that we'll say bye frank Thanks so bye much. all right talk to you later i'm gonna